So welcome to lecture seven of ECE 50 feet 12. So in today's lecture, we're going to look at several different types of modulation schemes, several more than what we saw in the last lecture. So we're going to look at QPSK. We're going to look at 16 QAM. We're going to look at um, MRE PAM. Okay. So what do, what do these all these acronyms mean? So QPSK, quadrature phase shift keying. We're going to contain the information about what binary patterns are being transmitted by these analog signal waveforms entirely in the phase, while in um, uh, 16 QAM, 16 quadrature amplitude modulation. What we do is we use a combination of amplitude and phase in order to encode those, that digital information in the signaling waveforms. And then lastly, MRE PAM or pulse amplitude modulation. This builds upon the binary PAM modulation that we looked at in the last lecture. There are two different types of uh, uh, signal waveforms. Or zero. Now we have forms, um, each with a different amplitude, each representing a different binary pattern. Okay, and we're going to do the same analysis as in the previous. Um, waveforms in terms of determining what is the power efficiency of the signaling waveforms. And there's some shockers here, folks, so we're going to explore that in this lecture. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to, first of all, um, uh, just have a quick review of what, what, what is meant to be um, um, information being contained within uh, the, uh, the signal. So let's so we know, okay. So we know that we can contain, like we can represent, okay, binary info in terms of amplitude phase and frequency. So what do I mean? So remember, recall from the last lecture, we talked about binary pulse amplitude modulation. Okay. And binary PAM, what happens is we either had a signal of amplitude A and of duration 0 to T, and that represented a 1, a binary 1. And if we had, let's say, the same shape of signal, but it had a minus a from 0 to t, that represents a 0, right? Beautiful. Now, let's look at, uh, we looked at a little bit BPSK. Now, in this case, what happens is the information is entirely contained within the phase of the signal. What do I mean to say by that? Uh, for instance, Suppose we take a sinusoidal waveform, right? And suppose it looks like this, right? From 0 to t, right? And suppose that phase, this guy is the reference 0 degrees, right? And this represents a 1. While on the other hand, let's say we have something that is 180 degrees out of phase. So what does 180 degrees out of phase look like? It's the exact opposite, right? Look how the peaks become valleys and valleys become peaks. So given that this is 180 degrees out of phase with the reference, and we call that a zero. So each one of these modulation schemes, the digital information, in this case is binary, right? If you have one waveform, and it's intercepted by the receiver, it decodes it or a zero, depending on what the amplitude is in the case of binary PAM. In the case of binary phase shift keying, we have the situation of, depending on what phase we're receiving that waveform in, during those T seconds of the symbol waveform, we can say it's either a one or a zero based on whether it is zero degrees out of phase or 180 degrees out of phase. Now, we, we haven't looked too much at frequency, but frequency works approximately the same way. So this is our recap from, uh, from the last class. Another recap is the following. It's a thing called 
the um, uh, power efficiency. Okay, power efficiency. And we define it as epsilon p is equal to d min squared. This is our Euclidean distance divided by the average energy per bit. Okay? And then those guys in turn d min squared is equal to the integral across the per symbol period of the difference of the two closest signals in terms of um, in, in the signal constellation space squared dt while the average bit energy is derived from the, the symbol energy of the ith symbol, which is the integral of that symbol S i of t squared dt. And then from that, you find the average symbol energy by summing across all i the probability of that symbol, SI occurring, okay, times the energy of that SI. All right? So, and then from there, we leapfrog one more. The average probability, uh, sorry, the average bit energy is equal to the average symbol energy divided by the number of bits that is represented by that signal, uh, by, that, by, by that type of modulation scheme. In other words, B is equal to what? Log base, uh, uh, sorry, log base, where M is the number of signal constellation points. And what we're trying to do is we're taking log base 2 of M, those number of signal constellation points, because those are going to be represented by B bits each, right? So given these expressions, and given sort of the basic modulation schemes we have seen so far, let's build upon this and uh, look at QPSK modulation. So quadrature phase shift keying. Okay. So this so this is our first foray, if you will, into going into a modulation scheme that has B greater than one. So we looked at BPAM and BPSK. B is equal to one, right? The symbol is e uh, the, the symbol energy uh, or is equal to the amount of energy expended per bit. Now we're looking at a case where we have per symbol two bits representing one symbol. So in order to achieve that, what how many different symbols do we need to represent uniquely? each, um, uh, you know, every possible combination um, of bits that form a two-bit pair. And the answer is 2 to the b, 2 to 2, which is equal to 4. We need four different signal representations, the symbol waveforms, if you will, that can represent any pair of binary digits that form a sequence that we want to re represent by a symbol. And so what we have is an example here of a signal constellation diagram of a QPSK signal, where we have S1, the vector, which is the signal constellation point, and it could represent, let's say, the binary pattern 0, 0. S2, which might represent 0, 1. S3, which might represent 1, 1. And S4, that might, might represent 1, 0. Notice the layout of this QPSK signal. They're all 90 degrees separated from each other. This is going to be important later on. Okay? So now, what we want to find out is how do we calculate the power efficiency of QPSK? And the answer is we use the exact same equations as we did before for BPSK and BPAM, but the math gets a little bit more tedious, so we're going to have to be a bit careful on how we handle this. So what we want to do is we, can, we, we use the equation that we, we, we saw before. So first of all, calculate d min squared. In order to do that, we need to choose 
two signal constellation points whose distance in the signal constellation diagram is the closest. So if you look at this, S1 and S3, or S2 and S4, are very poor choices because they are pretty far away relative to, let's say, adjacent pairings such as S1 and S2, S1 and S4, or S4 and S3, or S3 and S2, any one of those. So suppose, since it's very sym it's symmetric, Let's assume, without loss in generality, we take S2. Okay. First good news, they're orthogonal. They're 90 degrees separated, right? This is perfect. Because what happens is, because they're orth orthogonal, this will simplify to mathematics ever so slightly. So what sort of representation do we want, to, uh, like, like a sort of waveform representation? The signal representation do we want to have here in terms of sines and cosines? And the answer is we can represent when this two-dimensional modulation scheme where in terms of cosine and the amplitude of the cosine can be thought of as some sort of displacement along the x-axis while the sine and its amplitude is the displacement along the y-axis. So in many ways, this modulation scheme works by choosing two amplitudes, and each amplitude tells you which half of, let's say, the x-axis, with zero being its center, and then for the sine, which half of the y-axis, with zero being the center. It, so in, in many ways, each pairing of amplitude levels for sine and sine as we see here, this, in this, so same displacement from the origin, plus or minus a, each pair of amplitudes tells you which quadrant your signal constellation points located. So it's great, and it's all because of the orthogonality principle. So we can represent a QPSK waveform in terms of plus or minus a cosine omega ct. So omega c is the uh, carrier frequency in radians per second, and plus theta, and theta is some arbitrary phase rotation term, plus or minus a sine omega ct plus theta. So, calculate d min. What we do is we take s1 of t and subtract s2 of t from that. The, the two, those You could have chosen S1, S4, S4, S3, S3, S2. It's all the same. But let's say we choose S1, S2, and we subtract one from the other. So we, when we perform that operation, what we get is delta ST is equal to 2A sine omega CT. We also assume that it doesn't matter what the phase rotation is here, the, the theta. So we set it to zero, again, without loss in general. What we end up getting, okay, um, um, so let me go back to the previous slide. So if you take this guy and then you apply the integral expression like what you see here to 2a uh, sine omega ct, you get 2a squared well, how did you get that? Two is following. So we know that d min squared is equal to the integral from 0 to t of delta s of t squared. So the square of the difference of the two signals, and then we integrate from 0 to big T, the period of the symbol. Um, and what that does is essentially give us the energy of the difference, right? So we're told, like using the, tr uh, the trig identities and such, that first of all, we have a situation here of, what is it equal to? Two sine omega ct, all that squared dt. Now, uh, let's expand it. So what do we have? Zero to t, right? Four a squared sine squared omega ct dt. 
If we take it one step further, let's use the trig identity. So what's sine squared of anything is going to be half minus half cosine 2 omega ct. Two omega C T. Now we know this is a double frequency term, so we can leave that out. And we know that this half crosses out with that four, becomes a two. So what we're left with at the end of the day is two A squared integrated from zero to T DT. And that is equal to big T. So we have our answer, 2a squared T, like what we have written in the slide. So now we want to calculate what the average Let's Let's use the definition. First of all, we have four, four different symbols in order to calculate energies of. But using your intuition, we can see that every one of those signal constellation points are actually the same distance away from the origin. The amount of energy it takes in order to displace the signal constellation point from the origin to a point away from it, they're all equal. Therefore, have this, we can assume that they will all have, in this case, the same amount of energy. Another way of thinking about it is um, um, even if you change the phase of a signal, does phase factor into the power of the energy? Absolutely not. Only the if you have the same signal, but it's just the, only, the only thing that changes is its phase, it, all, it, it will for sure have the same energy. That's another way of looking at it. So, uh, how do we compute ESI? Well, we again go to our um, expression for the signal waveform as before, and you perform the mathematics that we talked about before. All right? So, what happens is um, suppose we use S1 of t. S1 of t is equal to A cos omega ct plus A sine omega ct. So, we know that it's in the right portion of the x-axis, the part that goes off to plus infinity, and it's of the top portion of the y-axis, the part that goes to plus infinity. So it's in the um, top, le uh, sorry, top right quadrant of the, of, of, of the uh, x, y, x, y plane, the real imaginary plane. So if we do the calculation and we take the square of this, it gets a little messy, but after doing a little bit of trig identities, what you'll find that in the end, this energy is equal to a squared t. So exercise for the student, um, um, EFTS, solve for yourself what ESI is equal to. Now, given that all the energies The average energy is going to be equal to a squared t, the average symbol energy. Now, what we need to do is find out what the average bit energy is, and we know what that is. That is essentially equal to the average symbol energy divided by two bits, because two bits represent every symbol. So now what we've got is squared t over 2. If we plug that into the power efficiency expression for uh, epsilon p, it turns out we get this wonderful result, which is 4. Remember what I said, a modulation scheme that uses all possible signal, uh, symbol representations to cover every possible binary pattern that can be produced, unique binary pattern that can be produced. Uh, so let's say if you have 4 bits, you're going to have 16 unique waveforms that represent every possible pattern of bits. When you have that situation, the best power efficiency ever hoped for is 4. And then it goes downhill from there. It gets smaller and smaller. 
actually use a modulation scheme, like a ternary uh, modulation scheme that, let's say, only uses three symbols, which means that you need two bits to represent each symbol uniquely, but then that means we are not using one possible binary pair of bits, right? Um, that actually turns out to have a very different, um, that turns out to have a very different um, outcome in terms of power efficiency. It actually has something higher than four. But excluding those cases, let's say we max out um, the number of sim symbol representations that, uh, or signal constellation points equal to uh, two to the we have to use in order to represent every symbol uniquely. If we have uh, the maximum number of uh, signal constellation points that we can produce using those B bits, um, the best you can do in terms of power efficiency is four. So why is QPSK so wonderful? It's because it has the same power efficiency as BPSK or BPAM. Um, these, these wonderful binary modulation schemes, but K transmits two bits Because if you have uh, a modulation scheme and you can afford, like, you know, if let's say you have a receiver that can discriminate between different types of phases and such, then this is great because what you essentially have is essentially a modulation scheme that is as power efficient as Q, uh, as the amount of information per symbol. It's powerful. Wonderful. That's why Q. QSK is such a popular choice in many wireless and wired standards. It has other advantages, which we'll see in the next lecture. And this is 16 quadrature amplitude modulation, or 16 QAM. So it's slightly different than QPSK. So notice, again, the, the cosine omega CT and sine omega CT um, that, are, that, have, uh, that have amplitude values that specify where that signal constellation point belongs in the real and imaginary plane. Now, what's interesting about 16 QAM is that um, the SI, okay, the, the signal, con uh, signal constellation point waveform, right, the waveform that represents each signal constellation point Instead of having the signal constellation points on a circle around the origin, what instead we get, especially with um, 16 QAM that is based on a rectangular or square pattern, is instead we have a grid of signal constellation points. And what in the next lecture is when you lay out these signal constellation points in a grid like pattern, actually to a very nice outcome in terms of receiver design. Okay. So 16 QAM has 16 possible symbol representations, S1, S2, all the way to S16. And the way it works is that we lay these signal constellation points out in kind of this grid-like pattern, right? Four by four. And so what the receiver needs to figure out is if it intercepts a signal over a period t, it has to determine which of the 16 points it is. And this is kind of interesting. What happens is a positive cosine amplitude and a positive sine amplitude. Automatically, I know which quadrant that signal constellation point could come from, um, assuming that the noise is not too bad. Then, um, if we can fine tune it and figure out how much the amplitude is on the cosine and the sine. We can zoom in on the point in that quadrant that that signal constellation point must be. So, in order to find the power efficiency of 16 QAM, we go through this exact same mathematics as, 16, uh, as QPSK, but as you can see, things get a little tedious, uh, a lot of trig and such. Okay? So, um, if you work this out, so let's say we, we go, go to the computer. What you've got, essentially, if you want to do 16 QAM, the power efficiency. Remember that the power efficiency is equal to d min squared over the average bit energy. 
So first of all, d min squared is equal to the integral of delta s t squared d t. Now, um, suppose we take, so let me draw my signal constellation point here, uh, signal constellation diagram here. Cute, huh? And suppose we take uh, the closest And 3a means this guy is 3a away along the x-axis and a along the y-axis, right? And so what happens is if we do the math, well, these guys cancel. And what we're left with is 2a cos omega ct. Beautiful, huh? Now, we plug this in. is that we get 4a squared, right? And the cosine squared now becomes half plus half cos 2 omega ct, okay, dt, double frequency term, 2a squared, like before with the um, uh, QPSK, um, uh, 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 minimum Euclidean distance. Now, if we now calculate what the average energy is, okay, per symbol. Uh, this is a little trickier because now, as opposed to before, where we had that unfortunate situation, uh, I mean, sort of fortunate situation that everything was the same distance away from the origin, now we don't. Now we have a pattern. So some signal constellation points are further away from the origin than others. Some have more energy than the others. But here's another trick. So suppose I draw 16 QAM. Do you notice that this guy is the same distance like this guy, this guy, and this guy? And likewise, these guys? You get my point, right? Essentially, we have a symmetry going on. So in reality, in, instead of calculating all the s symbol uh, energies, all we really need to do is calculate just one quadrant. Calculate one quadrant. Okay? So that simplifies life simply we can do it that way. So if we do that, what it turns out is that at the end of the day, we find that the average symbol energy is equal to 5a squared t. So this is an exercise for a student, or EFTR, uh, EFTS, sorry. Um, count, find out what that average symbol energy is and use the trick I just mentioned. Use symmetry. And if you calculate what the average bit energy is, it happens to be how many bits represent 16 possible unique waveforms. Log, of, log base 2 of 16 gives you 4. So 4 is needed to represent every symbol waveform. So as a result, our power efficiency is 8 fifths. This is much less than 4. So 16 QAM is actually not that power efficient relative to QPSK and BPSK and all that. On the other hand, you cram in 
double the number of bits you would have with a QPFK transmission. Now, as the number of bits and symbols increases, what we see is that that middle Euclidean distance just gets smaller and smaller and smaller, right? Because we're cramming in more and more signal constellation points in, in the same area. So we have less space, more margin for, uh, sorry, less margin for error, and the, the, the distance just keeps on shrinking. Okay? So as a result, like, you know, so as we'll see later in this class, um, you can mathematically relate the probability of error for a signal constellation point, uh, or a signal constellation um, based on the number of points that it possesses and its minimum Euclidean distance by this expression here. Uh, it's an approximation. And what you'll see is it's real, your probability is actually going to be based on, um, in part, by your Euclidean distance. Say, okay, well, why is that? Well, for instance, let, let, me, let me draw what I mean. So if let's say, actually have this sort of fuzzy region of signal constellation points. You can tell by nearest neighbor, right? Okay, but now if we have 16 QAM and we have the same amount of noise like I've drawn over on the left side here, this actually becomes a problem because now notice how they begin to overlap with one another. And when you get a signal constellation point to be bumped over because of noise to be closer to another incorrect signal constellation point, you, that's where your bit error rates, uh, bit errors begin to materialize. And that's a bad thing. And that's what the expression on this slide is showing. Essentially, the Q function there um, shows the relationship between the Euclidean distance between signal constellation points. Let's look at this. Let's look. Okay. We saw for um, binary PAM and BPSK, they're almost the same thing, especially binary. Uh, well, if BPSK is totally antipodal, it's 180 degrees out of phase with each other, we have a power efficiency that is equal to 4. And if we use delta SNR, which is the SNR loss, right? Um, it's the ratio of four is the best possible power efficiency versus that signal constellation, uh, sorry, that modulation scheme, which in this case is four. So what is uh, log of one? Same thing for QPSK, but SNR loss is equal to zero, but we get twice the amount of bits per symbol. Very powerful stuff. Suppose we have eight PSK. That means eight signal constellation points on the same circle around the origin in the a uh, real imaginary plane. We have three bits per symbol, but we now have an SNR loss of 3.5. 8 AMPM, so that's amplitude modulation, phase modulation. We have um, a, 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 a SNR loss of 1.6. And finally, 6 QAM, we have an SNR loss of 4, okay, which is defined here, SNR loss. So what happens is, as the number of signal constellation points begin to um, increase, we actually witness a power efficiency decrease. And this is, this is, this is to be expected. So more, the more uh, signal constellations, which means the more bits we're representing per symbol, and the more unique symbols we need to represent every possible pattern of bits that can be generated by the transmitter, um, our power efficiency decreases. So Okay, the last thing we're going to look at is MRE pulse amplitude modulation, or MPAM. So MPAM, just like in the slides, is a beautiful This is a 
and this is minus a. What this tells me is, let's say that if I get a signal that has negative a amplitude, it means that a zero has been transmitted. And if I get a signal that's intercepted by a receiver and it has an a amplitude, a one's been transmitted. And another way of looking at it, just like I drew before, so that's amplitude a over a symbol period of t. That's an amplitude minus a. That means this guy here is a 1, and that guy here is a 0. Now, m -ary pam or m pam is interesting. Instead of, just stop, uh, instead of just having two possible amplitude values, instead what we have is we have a, we have 3a, we have 5a, and we have minus a, we have minus 3a, we have minus 5a, and we have a total of m possible amplitude values. Okay. This is wonderful stuff. So as a result, what you essentially have is that unique rectangular pulse, PFT, which looks like this, right? Height 1 and 0 to t. And what we do is we multiply by one of those m possible amplitude values and transmit it over every t seconds with each amplitude value representing a binary, a c combination of binary bits produced by a high speed uh, stream of bits coming from some sort of binary source. And um, which amplitude has been received? And that's beautiful stuff because now what you've got is this modulation scheme going for you, but is it power efficient? So now let's look at the let's look at the slides. So let's say we look at 4 PAM. We have this setup. And as I mentioned before, um, each waveform essentially um, is some sort of unit step function that lasts t seconds, right? Should be PT, UT, it's the same thing and has an amplitude value ai. And you can assume either minus 3a, minus a, a, or 3a in terms of value. And those values represent the binary. So what is the power efficiency? So if we go through the math, okay, so you calculate the minimum Euclidean distance, it turns out it will be equal to 4a squared t. And the average symbol energy will be 5 a squared t, which means that the average bit energy is equal to 5 a squared t over 2. It turns out that our power efficiency for PAM is equal to 8 over 5. We saw this before. This has the same power efficiency as 16 QAM. Hmm, interesting. It's like deja vu. But there's a problem. How many bits are transmitted by 4 PAM? 2. How many bits are transmitted by 16 QAM? 4. As a result, we have the same power efficiency between these two modulation schemes, but one has double the throughput versus the other. Powerful stuff. Let's generalize it. Let's look at M PAM. Of a generic expression. So if we had, say, from minus m minus 1 a to m minus 1 a amplitude value, right? Every 2 a, a new amplitude value, amplitude value, amplitude value. So we have, in the end, m possible amplitude values. What's the power efficiency of this? As it turns out, let's say we take an pair. Let's say we take S1 of t and S2 of t, and they're on either side immediately next to the origin. That's a minimum Euclidean distance, but any pairing, any adjacent pair of signal constellation points will work. If we calculate the d min squared and the average symbol energy, what it turns out is that in the end, and you use some tables, it turns out that the power efficiency of emery pen, the generic power efficiency of MRE PAM is equal to 12 to the power of k divided by 2 to the power of 2k 
minus 1, where k is the number of bits. This gives you the power efficiency of an MRE PAM signal when you have k bits representing every symbol, right? So 2 to the k possible s signal constellation point. And if you do the sanity check, uh, when k is equal to 2, so we know we did something right. So an exercise for the student, EFTS, derive this at home. You're, going, you're not going to be able to, uh, unless you, well, you could spend time trying to uh, prove that that summation is equal to that fraction, but if you just take it, take it for granted, um, it is recommended to try this out at home to get this generic expression. Okay. So that concludes um, lecture 7 of ECE uh, uh, 5312.